This episode of Hello Monday is brought to you by Delta. Delta flies to 300 cities. That's 300 cities where people sing in the car, 300 cities where people miss someone in one of the other 299 cities. And Delta isn't flying to those 300 cities merely to bring us together, but to show us we're not that far apart in the first place. Delta, keep climbing. From the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, a show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. This is an episode about an underdog. And I love an underdog. I think a lot of people do. Because they're the ones who aren't supposed to win. At work, at life, wherever the odds aren't in their favor. And yet they pull it off anyhow. And once you've been the underdog, you understand that you don't have to be the favored contestant to win. It gives you a kind of superpower for your career. It lets you take risks because the stakes are lower if you fail. People assumed you were going to fail anyway. It makes you believe, like really believe that you can pull off just about anything if you put your mind to it. You've done it before. And sometimes it makes you able to see a winner when no one else does. When Troy Carter met Lady Gaga, she didn't seem like the kind of artist who is about to become a worldwide sensation. And she had just gotten dropped from Def Jam Records and she was sleeping on her grandmother's couch for a while in West Virginia. But Troy recognized something special and he signed her. And maybe one reason he could see it is because he knew something about underdogs. He'd been one his entire life. He grew up in a dangerous part of West Philly where he wanted to become a rapper. And, well, I'll let him take the story from here. In, uh, like, eighth grade, you know, I had this dream of being a rapper. So in ninth grade, I met my my best friend named Jazz. And um, and we came up with this idea that we were going to do this rap group called Too Too Many. And it was with his cousin, Ant. And, uh, and basically, we called it Too Too Many because we only could afford things for one of us. So it was all, always Too Too Many of us. And, uh, and we, we had this dream of, you know, one day we meet Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince, and they were going to give us a record deal. And so we kind of set out on that mission. Look, a lot of people may have that dream. But when you say that you had a mission, I mean, you, you stood out in the snow in front of their office, right? Uh, yeah, we were kind of like borderline stalkers. So we, we would go like, uh, whether it was cutting school to go down and stand out in front of the studio or after school, we would go um, down to the studio and we just would wait out there um, pretty much until until one day somebody actually let us into the recording studio and we did an audition for Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince that day. What was that like? You know, it was it was it was crazy because you think about, you know, at that young age, having that level of uh, commitment and craziness to actually do that. And then um, and then to have the bravery and heart to, to, to just pop in a demo tape and, and do an audition, uh, audition live on the spot. But um, they took a liking to us. And I remember Will Smith drove us home that night because we didn't have a way to get home from the recording studio. And from that point on, you know, he, uh, he and his manager, James Lasseter, took us under their wings. So they took you under their wings, but you didn't, in fact, grow into a rapper. So what exactly happened? Uh, I realized how terrible I was <laughs> as, as an actual rapper. <laughs> but, um, so that was like a short, short-lived career, short-lived dream. But they were kind enough to let me intern for them and, um, and learn a bit about the music business. So, you know, I worked at Jazzy Jeff's recording studio as like an assistant at the recording studio. Um, I worked as uh, Will and James Lasseter's um, personal assistant at some point and um, worked for them when they start, started their company, Overbrook Entertainment. So they gave me an opportunity to learn the business side, which um, I actually fell in love with even more than, the, than being an artist. And during this time, what did you do for school? Like, how were you in school? What, what was interesting to you? Yeah, I actually, I, I dropped out of school in, a, in 11th grade, which, you know, my mom was just brokenhearted. And she ended up putting me on a bus to go to a program called Job Corps, which is like, you know, this is like a government sponsored program where you go there and you learn a trade. And uh, I think Maria Shriver's family actually, you know, started this program years ago with great intent. 
But, you know, it ended up being one of those programs where, you know, if you're a juvenile delinquent, the courts end up sending you there or your parents ended up end up sending you there when you you sort of out of control or drop out of school. So I got sent to Job Corps and she said, you're going to come home with a diploma or a GED. And I, within six months or seven months, I got my GED and then came home and sort of focused on music from there. That sounds excruciating as a program. On the other hand, it sounds like you came away with a piece of paper a lot sooner than you would have come away with it if you'd sat through the rest of high school. Exactly. You know, so I think I was motivated to get out of there as quickly as possible. And um, so, so that, that motivation helped work. But also, you know, I think, you know, in terms of education, I dropped out of school in 11th grade, but I would go to I would go to the library, you know, a few times a week and just kind of learn about subjects that I that I wanted to learn about. And um, so I've always been this curious person and this perpetual learner. I just couldn't do it um, in the typical school structure. So that was one of those uh, things that, you know, I, I, I learned about myself uh, very early on that, you know, I, I'm a perpetual learner, but it's from a structural standpoint, just not in the typical educational system structures. Well, where do you think your motivation comes from? You know, because Troy, if you look over the long arc of your career, you've had such a passion and a drive. No matter what you've done, you've completely applied yourself. Is that innate? Is it learned? You know, I think I got lucky because I, I, I fell in love with hip hop culture, you know, from the time I was I, I, as far back as I could remember. And so, you know, whether it was break dancing, whether it was, you know, the, the style of clothes, graffiti culture, um, music and DJ. And it was like this thing that was happening as hip hop was coming onto the scene that I was just so enamored with and inspired by. So my, my fuel has always been inspiration. And, um, and so I've always followed that. So, you know, I got lucky enough to fall in love with music early. And, you know, I've, I, that the artists that I've managed, you know, were mostly artists that I've been really, really inspired by the actual art. And so, like, I was never driven financially where, you know, I thought, okay, I could get rich doing this or anything like that. It was really driven by, you know, just the passion of, of, of and, and the culture of music. So let's talk about the actual thing that you did early on with musicians and later with tech companies. Now, I guess a little of both. I was reading this piece about you, and in it, you were quoted as saying, this job is about believing when no one else does. And I want to know where your commitment comes from, for you to believe yourself over everybody else. Yeah, I think, you know, I, because I was, I've been the underdog all my life, you know, I think I'm naturally in the corners of, of, of the underdogs. And so, I, you know, I know what it, is, what it feels like when, you know, you're trying to get an idea out of your head or when you worked on something so hard and you just got to get those first couple of people on board or if you need somebody just to kind of, you know, be a voice for you and kind of push you and, and motivate you or motivate other people on your behalf. And so, you know, I, I just naturally fell into that role, you know, as a manager, just being an, an advocate for, for artists that I that I cared about. You know, so when I knew the music was good, you know, I wanted everybody else to hear the music. So whether I was personally going around passing out, you know, cassette tapes or CDs or flyers to shows, you know, I still do that now. You know, if it's an artist that I love, I'm the first person, you know, to send out songs on email or invite people to shows, you know, so I become this advocate. And then that transferred over to, you know, investing in entrepreneurs, you know, because the ideas that entrepreneurs have is, it's, you know, sometimes is that same idea that, I, I compare it to an artist having this idea about a song that, you know, you just got to get it out of you. And sometimes it's like that with entrepreneurs. So we like to be that first, you know, check in to that company or that first call that 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 entrepreneur makes when, you know, they have a new idea or, you know, they, they they're trying to figure out a problem. So that's where I get my my, my fuel and my and, and my fire from. So early on before the entrepreneurs and even before Lady Gaga, how did you get started rapping and promoting other people? How did that transition happen for you? 
Well, you know, I, I, Philly basically was this place where, you know, in my neighborhood, uh, hip hop music was coming up and none of the big promoters wanted to touch hip hop acts. So, you know, I saw this opportunity early on just to start bringing people to play like neighborhood places. So, you know, I scraped up some money from, you know, people in the neighborhood and, you know, and paid 2,500 bucks for like Wu-Tang Clan to do their first show in Philadelphia. Um, you know, Foxy Brown and Jay-Z, uh, uh, Notorious B.I.G. and Junior Mafia. So a lot of the acts that the bigger promoters wouldn't touch, you know, that that was an opportunity for me to uh, to bring them into Philadelphia. And that's how I built a lot of my relationships from taking those early bets and, and, and being there for, for a lot of those guys in the early days. So you took those early bets. You also had to be right about some of those early bets. At that point in your career, how much of what you were doing was hustle and how much of it was being really smart? Uh, I think, uh, you know, most of it was hustle. And I wouldn't, I, I don't, I don't think it was a strategy in place, to be honest with you. I just was, I'm like, Okay, I love Wu Tang Clan. I want to bring Wu Tang Clan to Philly. I know they're hot in Philly right now. Let me call and see if I could get Wu Tang Clan. Or with Notorious B.I.G., you know, it, it was the same exact thing. And sometimes I was wrong. You know, there there were shows that I promoted where you know it was more people on the crew that day than people in the audience who paid for tickets. But I built the reputation of when. You showed up, no matter whether it was one person in the audience or whether it was, you know, sold out, you got paid regardless. And um, and the act would still play. So if it was only 50 people in the audience of a place, you know, that held 2000 people, that act still played for those 50 people. So I think, you know, sort of building that reputation with the audience who was the customer, but also building that reputation that no matter what, you still got paid, you know, that that meant a lot because back then people, you had promoters that would go out of the back door when, you know, when things didn't go so well and the acts never got paid. So I was, I was always, well, how did he make that happen? What do you, what do you mean? Well, how did he make sure that people got paid? I mean, you know, oh, because I would, I would always raise enough that covered the expenses and I didn't just go off the float of the ticket sales. And so most of the times uh, people just wanted to float everything off of the ticket sales. So if the tickets didn't sell, you were, you know, you were stuck still owing people. So I made it so where the money that I raised always went to, um, we had enough to cover everything, even if we were going to take a loss. And then you just roll that loss over to the next show that you do. So you can make sure that, you know, whoever uh, you, you borrow money from to promote the show, they, they got paid back their money. You know, it's interesting listening to you, how the importance you place on your social network, the actual relationships, even early on, you seem to intuitively understand that being good to the people you work with was inherent to being successful. What were you doing? Well, it was, you know, and part of it too was, you know, back then hip hop was a dangerous business. So, you know, if you didn't keep your word, it wasn't, you know, there weren't lawsuits or anything like that. You know, you could physically get hurt. So there was there there was a lot of risk involved and in not ta and not keeping your word. And most of the people that we that we dealt with, whether it was the artists, managers, you know, um, whoever else, these were people that that were from the streets as well. So that you know, everybody, if you if you didn't have a contract and you shook somebody's hand, that handshake meant a lot. So what happened to you next professionally? Uh, I met Puffy, aka P Diddy, when I did a show for Notorious B.I.G. And Notorious B.I.G. was a no-show. And it was because he was shooting the the video for Big Papa that night and it ran over. So And he was in New York and couldn't make it down. So um, I got into an argument on the phone with Mark Pitts, who was Biggie's manager. And, um, and Puffy snatched the phone from Mark and me and him got into a bit of an argument on the phone. But, you know, he still drove down. Um, Puffy made sure that I got my deposit back from the show. And um, and he made sure that I got another show with Biggie. And at that show, um, I, I mean, at, when Puffy came down, I actually 
took him to an after party and we, you know, hanging out at the club and I asked him for a job, you know, because I, I, I had a lot of respect for what he did. You know, this was a guy who was a few years older than me, but was one of the youngest record companies in the history of, of, of music. He, you know, and that's, that was my aspiration. So he ended up giving me an internship at Bad Boy and I started working for him from there and sort of learned the, the sort of hand to hand combat of entrepreneurship from Puffy and sort of marry that to like that 30,000 foot view of working with Will Smith and James Lasseter. So it was just this sort of great juxtaposition of, of different styles of entrepreneurship. We're taking a quick pause here. Coming up after the break, Troy talks about meeting Lady Gaga. This episode of Hello Monday is brought to you by Delta. Delta flies to 300 cities around the world. That's 300 cities where everyone does the same things you do. That's 300 cities where the people in those 300 cities think they're the only ones who know about that one really great place. 300 cities where on the way there, you can listen to Hello Monday on the in-flight entertainment system. For real. Delta isn't flying to 300 cities merely to bring us together, but to show us that we're not that far apart in the first place. Delta, keep climbing. And we're back. Last we heard, Troy talked about being a young, hustling entrepreneur. Did you feel once you had been introduced to entrepreneurship that it was somehow inherently who you were, Troy? Yeah, I, you know, I, I definitely always wanted to work for myself. My um, my great uncles were really great entrepreneurs, you know, um, not in the sense of like people would know them nationally or maybe even locally, but they were com- they were v- community based entrepreneurs where, you know, one my grandmother's brother, one of them owned a funeral home business in, in Philadelphia. And, you know, he he worked for himself, you know, had a middle class family. And, you know, one of my uncles had my great uncles had a, a hairstyling business and a bar and a, and a shoe shine shop, you know, within within uh, within his neighborhood. And then one of my other uncles was a, a minister who, you know, had his own church. So these were like men who I looked up to. And so seeing and then also there were a lot of great black entrepreneurs in my neighborhood that owned the local dry cleaners and, you know, the restaurants on on the corner. And then after a while, we saw, you know, one wave of turnover where immigrants came into the neighborhood and, and you saw a shift from local entrepreneurs to immigrant entrepreneurs. And then from the immigrant entrepreneurs, you saw gentrification and sort of chains come in. So I, I was kind of watching this turnover. But for me, it was about ownership and this whole idea around pride of ownership. And, um, and that, that, that's always been important to me, you know, this, this idea of pride of ownership. You started a company. You sold that company. And that was all before we got to the point in your career where you met Lady Gaga, right? Yes. Um, my first management business, you know, I, I ended up um, building that up after I worked for Puffy I started managing the artist Eve and then met my co-founder, Jay Irving, and we built up a company in um, Philadelphia, which was this uh, really cool boutique talent management company. And after four years, we sold it to a company called Sanctuary uh, Group out of the UK. So that was sort of like the first uh, exit opportunity that, that we had as entrepreneurs. And now coming out of that, what? I was particularly struck by Troy. The very first time I heard it was this point where you were at when Lady Gaga came into your life. And that is that you had ups at that point, you had downs at that point, and you were bottoming out. You were, I believe, on the verge of bankruptcy. Is that right? Yeah, that that was a complete wipeout. You know, just probably one of the um, most important lessons I've learned is, you know, sort of entrepreneur, dad, husband, where I, I sold my company and realized a year and a half into the deal that I made a, a terrible mistake and that, you know, I just wasn't a good fit. And I didn't do the diligence on the company we had sold to at the time as much as they were had done their diligence on, on us. And, you know, it, it, it was good for the exit, but it wasn't good for my spirit. And, and 
I decided I wanted to get to buy the company back. And, you know, we went through this negotiation. Then, you know, it, it, it just was a bad experience. And when I got the, when I was able to get the company back, I had this idea that I was going to start this new company. I invested, you know, the money that I made back into the new company, had this fancy office on Wilshire Boulevard, you know, hired this team. And the idea I was going to take my client Eve, and we were just going to take this new business to the next level. And she walked in one day and basically said she wanted to move in another direction and, uh, and ended up firing me, which I was not prepared for at that time. And that was literally as, you know, the world was going into this financial crisis, you know, around 2006, going into like 2007. So there was no credit available. There was no cash in my bank account. Um, was really having um, issues with debt from my house being foreclosed on to cars being re repossessed and, and, you know, the couldn't pay tuition for the kids' school and really literally down to the point where I couldn't put gas in my hybrid car at one point, which was like, you know, I, I, I remember pulling over on the road, you know, one, one day on the side of the road and just boo-hooing in my car. And, you know, it, it just was like the point where I knew I hit rock bottom. And a, a friend of mine, Vincent Herbert, had called me up and said it was a, um, an artist that he wanted me, me to meet that he had saw on my space through another mutual friend. And, um, and that artist ended up being um, Lady Gaga. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you saw in Lady Gaga 2006. Yeah, you know, when she, when she walked in, automatically, you know, I knew she was a very unique artist just because she didn't look like any, any other artist that I've ever seen before. You know, where, she, you know, the big sunglasses and, and fishnet stockings and, you know, really looking like a, a, a rock star out, out of the gate. And she had just gotten dropped from Def Jam Records and, and, um, she was sleeping on her grandmother's couch for a while in West Virginia, sort of kind of recovering because she, being a, 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 a pop star was a, her dream. And then to get dropped from a record label six months after, you know, you just think the world is collapsing at that point. So, you know, when she came in, you know, she, very, very sweet, very humble, but definitely focused on this is what I want to do. And her dad had given her a year um, to figure it out or, or, unless, or she was going to have to go back to school. So it was just this hunger. And then the music was great. So I think between, you know, the, the music being great and, um, and, and also just this thing about her, like she was so clear on who she, who she wanted to become it was almost infectious. So, you know, I, I, I jumped right in and I told Vince who introduced us, I said, Vince, you got to promise to, to, to bring her back. And a few months later, uh, she came back and uh, I took her to the fanciest restaurant that I could afford at that time. Um, this Italian restaurant called Spaghetti Warehouse. And, um, and, and I was hoping that my credit card was, wasn't going to decline, by the way. And, um, and we, you know, we sat there and I kind of told her about, you know, what, what I wanted to do. And she told me about what she wanted to do. And we, we just set off on this journey and just hustled. We hustled from there. So one of the things that was really remarkable about those early days was your use of social tools that now, you know, we take for granted, but they were still really original at the time, right? Yeah, it, it actually came out of, of, of desperation because no no radio station would play her music at the time. Um, you know, they, they, I think pop music sounded very different where it was um, it was more Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Jessica Simpson. And we had this idea of let's give pop music the flu. And so we're going to come in from a totally different angle. And it, this was this four on the floor electronic music. And the first single was this record called um, Just Dance. And, but radio stations wouldn't play it. So we used like YouTube and 
uh, and Twitter and Facebook just to kind of start building audience and getting the music out. This is like at the beginning of like when blogs were like, you know, just really getting hot and just kind of looking for any sort of outlet where we could find somebody that was going to going to play the music. Gosh, I remember that song. It was just sort of framed this entire era of my life. I think it probably did for a lot of people during that time. It's amazing what a piece of music can do in that way. Almost the entire year. Well, it took a year to get that song, almost a year to get that song played on the radio. And, you know, so, it's, you know, it, I think it's it, one of the lessons that that I learned was if, you know, and, and this is when you, you sort of marry instinct with early data and finding like those first few fans in the very beginning and like understanding that feeling of, OK, it feels like we really have something here. Let's just stick with it. And just, and, you know, and so it just was not giving up on that record. And your career also took a different direction at that time. So tell me about that. I think prior to that, maybe, you know, uh, uh, 2011, um, I started investing in early stage technology companies and um, and sort of taking on this interest in, in other entrepreneurs. How do we, how do I invest resources into other entrepreneurs. And that came just through entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley being curious about what I was doing in LA with marketing initiatives on Gaga. So that created a lot of relationships. And from there, you know, I think I, I invested in between then and now maybe over 120 companies, but, you know, meeting Uber very early on, uh, meeting the Zimride founders who became, you know, Lyft. Uh, Dropbox, uh, Warby Parker, uh, Wish, and just a, a, a lot of uh, great entrepreneurs who I started working with, you know, in, within that 2011 time period. And so the business has shifted from just doing talent management into early stage technology investing. And one of the companies was Spotify, and I was consulting for those guys and built a great relationship with the founder, Daniel. And and I ended up uh, going into Spotify and building out a, a division for them called Creator Services uh, and, you know, just work with the company on building relationships with artists, labels, music publishers, how, how is that structured globally, um, was part of the team that took the company public. And then uh, last year decided that, you know, it felt it was great, great run. But uh, it felt like a job, and I'm like, okay, uh, time to get back to, to, to what I do best. Well, Troy, as you're listing these companies, Uber, Lyft, Wish, Spotify, it strikes me that you've also figured out how to pick winners among tech companies. So what's the same about picking tech company winners and entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think on like when it comes to investing, I think I know how to pick people. I, I know how to pick people better than I know how to pick companies, and and because I think picking the right people, um, they're going to figure it out. Because the 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 initial business that I may invest in, the right founder when it's not working, they're going to be able to pivot and and shift. So that initial idea may not be the final idea, you know, so and that, you know, that's just the case with most of the companies that we that that we've invested in. And with great artists is a lot of the similarities of that idea of we're going to figure it out because being a being aiming to be the biggest star in the world is very, very hard work. Aiming to build, you know, a, a billion dollar business or, you know, a $50 billion business, that's borderline delusional. So it's like you got to operate with a certain amount of confidence, delusion, rigor, humility, thick skin, um, passion, all of these things that are going to wake you up on those days when you don't want to get out of bed, you know, when when competition has ha, has gotten you down or the press is, is is eating you alive you know you gotta you gotta you gotta be a, a very unique person to want to get out of bed and still do it so delusion is actually a pretty critical part of the equation then 
being able to believe sort of beyond what most people would believe is reasonable? It's a very important part because it, it is for you to want to be the biggest pop star in, 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 in the world, you got to get out of bed pretending that you're the biggest pop star in the world when nobody knows who you are. You got to walk into rooms where, you know, meeting people for the very first time with, with an aura about you. And when you're an entrepreneur and you're pitching to VCs or you're selling your idea to, to, the, to the public markets, you got to convince people to, to believe in something that sometimes may have never happened before. So, you know, a lot of the companies that we've invested in are going up against incumbents who might have been around for, you know, 50 to 100 years at times, or they're inventing products that don't exist. So to convince people of that, you know, is, or, or to even think of the idea sometimes is, a, is, is, a, is a, a dose of delusion that has to go into it to, 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 to think that you're the person who's uniquely qualified for, to, uh, who, who's uniquely qualified to be able to do this. And because I've operated with this delusion all my life, like, you know, coming from West Philly and, and, and growing up the way that I grew up, like, I, I got lucky because Will Smith was delusional to actually think that a rapper could go from being a neighborhood rapper to having a, t a TV show on NBC uh, called Fresh Prince of Bel-Air when nobody thought that it could be done and no one had ever done it before. Or television stars were never movie stars before. And, you know, he went from television to being one of the biggest movie stars in the world. So I witnessed, I was so close to delusion that I, just, that I learned to be a little delusional. Thank you, Troy. Thanks for spending the time with us and sharing your story with us. Looking forward to it next time. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you. Again, that was Troy Carter. His newest company is called Q and A. And I wish I could believe in every idea I have and every person whose work I appreciate with the conviction Troy brings to his own beliefs. That, in the end, is what it means to be the underdog. If you like the story, maybe you can think of other underdogs you'd like featured on the show. Write to us at hellomonday at linkedin.com or post on LinkedIn using the hashtag hellomonday. If you enjoyed listening, subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Laura Sim. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriondo is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Maya Mangini and Victoria Taylor will always cheer for the underdogs. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder, and you also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening.